Um, but I remember standing on the field in Indonesia and, um, and I get emotional when I think about it. And just saying, this is it. This is the place. People are going to meet Jesus here. We're doing our, our festival here. And the locals actually said, you're crazy. No one's ever done a festival on that field. We've got two other festival fields that the city uses. And it doesn't make any sense. And, you know, someone, uh, a, a local businessman offered to clear the whole field for us. He had to, he had to bulldoze, you know, the area, flatten it out. We had... Um, it was just stunning what we saw. We had uh, the, the preparations all came together and then it rained for seven weeks before the event. Is my microphone in the wrong spot or something? It's very challenging this morning. Ah, uh, okay. I don't know whether... Just bring it um, out from your bed a bit more. Bring it out a bit like that. That might be better. And then you could just turn me up because I'm kind of into the microphone. All right. It was just stunning, I was saying, it was just stunning to, because it rained for seven weeks before the festival. When you're doing these out, outdoor events, what do you need? You need good weather. And it rained, have I told this story? Did I tell it last time? No, okay, good, you're in for a treat. <laughs> for seven weeks it rained every single day from about 2 p.m. until about 7 or 8 p.m. You've got to understand that uh, our festival started at four o'clock every day. So then you've got to do your preparation before, then the festival happens. It was a four day event. People come, in their, they walk in their trucks, everything. They come to the festival field. And my festival director called me and said, it's not gonna work. We can't do this festival because it rains every day. Their rainy season was basically messed up this year. It was in the wrong time. They gave us the wrong advice. You know, it's the wrong, we can't do it now. And I said to him, I said, it will not rain on this festival because it's God's festival. God wants his good news preached in this city. And so we will preach the gospel in this city. It's a 50% Muslim city. Many of the Christians aren't even saved. They just call themselves Christians. He wants his gospel to go out. And so we get to this field that everyone said I was crazy to use. Um, and on the first day, there's a little bit of rain starting to come, as had happened for seven weeks. And they literally said seven weeks with one day break in the whole seven weeks. And so they said every day consistently like clockwork. And we began to worship. I said, everyone sing, let's sing. And we just stretched out our hands and prayed and the rain held off. And it was like a wall of rain. I'm not exaggerating. We have photos, videos, it's, it's stunning. And then for the next four days, it did not rain on our field. Now, to give you context, the other two fields, one was two minute drive away and the other one was about three minute drive away were absolutely drenched every single night. They said that when you're in town, not they said, my mum told me, because she was driving in, so my parents um, live in that part of Indonesia. She said, when you're driving in from town, all of town is black skies and it's raining and there is a circle of light over your field. And the whole town is talking about how the God of the Christians has power because it won't rain on their event. And for four days it did not rain. And I said this, I said, as a sign that this is the Lord, it will pour down rain on Sunday in a way that everyone will know God held back the rain. And on that Sunday, after we left, the last night was Saturday night, it poured down rain so heavy they had a flood and five houses were swept away. So the whole city was talking, wow, the rains are back. But they weren't there for four days, just in that location. It was absolutely stunning. Now, how did I know that it wasn't going to rain on our festival field? Because one, I have faith, and two, I have a great God. But three, on my wedding day, it, uh, Joyce and I, on our wedding day, it was raining all morning. And my mother called me and said, Andrew, you need to change the venue where we're doing an outdoor wedding. 
it's going to rain on your wedding. And I said, it will not rain on this wedding in Jesus name. And when we got there, the rain stopped. And as we began to worship, we've got photos of the sun just bursting out. We got married at Mill Valley Ranch outdoors under the willow trees for those familiar with it. And the sun burst through the willow trees. And as the afternoon tea was wrapping up at the end of the service, the rain came again. And it rained all afternoon and all night. And, you know, I knew that if God was faithful then, 13 to 14 years ago, he's going to be faithful today. And we can speak to this weather. It's not going to rain. And how did I know on my wedding day that I could declare that it would not rain? Because we see in scripture that Jesus speaks to the storm. He speaks to the storm and the storm has to obey. We have authority in Jesus. And today I want to speak to us uh, a little bit about uh, Moses and the life of Moses and some really significant moments in his life. Before we go there, I'll just share one more weather story. Uh, just bring up the, uh, the photo of the, of the plane if you can. And uh, I'll show you a video of Sean in Kenya as well. That was pretty fun. So this is a math flight. Praise God for math. And um, we actually had some generous donors that helped us pay for this flight because they're not cheap at all. And we had to fly. We were in Madagascar flying in and out of a missions hospital to support the missionaries that are there. And it was the 25th of January and I was scheduled to fly out and it was bucketing down rain. And Math actually called and said, we're going to cancel your, um, we're going to cancel your flight. Now I had to fly out at the, on the 26th of January, Australia Day, at 4 p.m., 4.25 p.m. And I'm thinking, this is not good. Well, my cousins looked at the, uh, the weather report and they said, you need to come up with a backup plan. You're gonna miss your flight tomorrow. They won't fly tomorrow morning either. It is bucketing down rain and it's forecast to rain. And I said, no, I will get on that international flight. I said, it will not rain tomorrow morning because I need to get out of here. And um, I miss my family too much. I had Sean with me, my son, but I was missing my beautiful wife, Joyce and Abby and Evan. And I said, I'm getting on that plane. It will fly. And uh, everyone kind of looked at me like I was a little bit crazy and I began to pray. And how did I know that the skies would clear up? Because I'd seen it in Indonesia. I'd seen it on my wedding day. I'd seen it in scripture. I know that God can do this. And uh, there's the picture of the plane coming in to pick us up with nice blue skies behind us. And so just want to brag on the goodness of God because he's so good. Let me show you just quickly, just before we jump into scripture, if we're okay. Is this all right? Are we good? <laughs> I figure I'd just get a little moment with you here and there. Um, a, a video of a song that we play when the, when the kids come to Jesus in Kenya, um, actually all around the world, we play this song. And the song is One Way Jesus. It's an old Hillsong song. But I want you to see Sean because some of you gave um, so that Sean specifically could come on mission with me. I've got a conviction that... I want to travel with my family. Like I, I believe that the best thing for family is to be together. And it's Billy Graham when he uh, was asked what his biggest regrets were, he wished he'd prayed more and he wished he'd spent more time with his family. So for me, I'm starting to say, look, if I, if I can't bring my family, I don't really want to go. But for example, this trip to Africa cost me uh, 4,000, uh, actually no, maybe a little bit more. And then it cost Sean 4,000. You imagine five of us, you know, you just end up going, well, there goes all of our ministry budget. So um, I share that to say thank you to those that support us so that we can go as a family. And I want you to see Sean just celebrating with these young people as they give their lives to Jesus. Will that video work? Yeah.
Isn't that so fun? It was so special. Um, so we play that song because we tell them when one person comes to Jesus, there's a great party in heaven. So we say, do you guys want a party? And of course they're like, yeah. And, uh, and then we have to ask the teachers not to beat them with sticks because they're allowed to be chaotic just for a couple of minutes. So it's quite a, it's, Kenya is, I always have to word up our evangelists that I bring with me. Hey champ. I always have to say, just be aware, they still hit kids with sticks here, so it can be quite front- confronting. Anyway, let's jump into the word. We good? Father, we're so thankful that you're here. We, we're thankful that you love us. We're thankful that you are faithful. We thank you that your word says, I believe in 2 Timothy, that when we are faithless, you remain faithful because you cannot deny yourself. And so, God, we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you also for your discipline. We thank you, God, that you want to take us further. You want to take us deeper. You want to take us higher. And we ask, Lord God, that you would speak to us today in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to have a look at the life of Moses. Some of you may be quite familiar with Moses. Some of you may be not so familiar Moses was a man that was chosen by God to lead his people out from from the Egyptians, from the rule of Pharaoh into the promised land. For those of you that went to uh, Sunday school back in the day, you may have heard the song, Pharaoh, Pharaoh, oh baby, let my people go. Yeah, 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 I said, Pharaoh, Pharaoh. Anyone? Anyone? Am I I all alone? Or was that, that was like... That was, thank you, that was a hit. That was a hit back in the day. So basically the nation of Israel, uh, God's chosen people had become enslaved by the Egyptians and the, and the Pharaoh was working them into the bone. And there was a young man by the name of Moses. I'm just trying to give you like a huge chunk of the Bible in just a few moments. You can read it for yourself. Uh, there was a young man named Moses, who was spared by the ruthless, uh, basically, genocide of the Egyptians at this time. So the Egyptians wanted to kill all of the firstborn males of the country, of the, of the nation, and so they first instructed the midwives to kill the boys, and the midwives wouldn't do it. So then uh, they had a plan to throw all of these Israelite babies into the river and to kill them. And so one of the, gr- these great miracles happen in that the Moses' sister, mother, this plan comes up where they put Moses into a basket and long story short, Moses' life is spared. He's adopted by the Pharaoh, actually raised by his own family, which is incredible. And he, he rises up in a place of, of honour, p- place of position, and is spared drowning in the water and is actually rescued from the very water that he should have been drowned in. And he grows up to be very favoured in Pharaoh's house. And then what does Moses do? For those of you who've seen the Prince of Egypt, or maybe you've read your Bible, Um, Moses kind of clues on to the fact that he might actually be a Hebrew. He might actually be an Israelite. And he starts seeing all these Hebrews getting mistreated. And he's seeing all these Israelites uh, that are are enslaved, that are fighting with each other. And he actually gets very upset at an Egyptian and kills him uh, for the way that he's treating one of the Hebrews. And then he confronts two of these uh, Israelites that are fighting with each other. And they say, what are you going to do about it? You're going to kill us like you did the Egyptian? And uh, Moses freaks out, realises that he's actually been found out, that he killed this Egyptian because he tried to do it in secret. How many of you know uh, what's put in secret actually gets revealed what's hidden gets revealed and so Moses flees into the wilderness he moves into the wilderness and while he's there I know I'm skipping a lot some of you are like oh you skipped my favorite part you know while he's in the wilderness um, he has an encounter with a burning bush and basically there's a bush that is on fire but doesn't burn up 
How many of you know that would spark your interest if you walked outside and there was a tree on fire but it never stopped burning and it, it, the leaves never went up and it just had flame in it and through it. And so Moses is quite intrigued. He comes near to the fire and as he comes near to the fire, the fire begins to speak to him because God is in the fire. And God asks Moses to go back to Egypt and to lead his people out of slavery so that they can come to a land that's their own, they can come to the promised land and they'll be free. And Moses naturally doesn't, well, I shouldn't say naturally, some of you would be like, hey, that sounds cool, I'd do that. But it's a big task to go up against Egypt and Pharaoh and he's a little bit nervous. And so he tries to come up with a few excuses and he tries to basically get out of the job. But God won't let him off the hook. And in God's anger, he actually says, look, you, you don't want to do it. You think you can't speak. You think you're not, you know, no one's going to listen to you. I'll give you Aaron. So Aaron is, becomes a helper for Moses and becomes his mouthpiece. The other thing that God does is he gives Moses a, well, Moses has a staff, but he supernaturally begins to work through this staff or this, uh, this wooden pole that Moses has. And now this pole will display the power of God to the Pharaoh. How many of you are familiar with this story? A few of you? All right, I tell you, read it again. You know, it just, the more I read it, the more I get out of it. The great thing about the Bible is the author is still alive. And so you can talk to him and he'll show you things that he put in there that you haven't yet picked up. And Moses, um, he's been given a mouthpiece. So that excuse is dealt with. He's been given supernatural power through this, this stick. That excuse is dealt with. And now he comes to the Pharaoh and he confronts the Pharaoh and he can do mighty kind of miracles and signs with this staff and you put it, put it in some water, it'll turn to blood, or you drop it on the ground, it'll turn into a snake. And, and he begins to say, basically, Pharaoh, if you don't let the Israelites go, there's going to be all of these plagues. And these plagues come, which we know in the end results with a plague that kills the, the firstborn of the Egyptians. But the Israelites are spared by the blood of the lamb, which is just the gospel right there. But we are spared by the blood of the lamb. Pharaoh is so angry, so upset at the death of his child, at the death of all of these children, at the death of uh, even livestock, that he says, basically, you can go. You, you are not going to be my slaves anymore. Off you go. They go. The Red Sea parts. They walk through the Red Sea. I mean... Talk about a miracle involving water. That's probably one of the most incredible miracles. Um, we're going to be talking a lot about water today. That's why I'm highlighting the river. I'm highlighting the Red Sea. They go through the sea and they are now free from Egypt. And this is where we're going to pick up our story. You ready? Exodus chapter 15, verse 22. So... Moses ordered Israel to set out from the Red Sea and they went into the wilderness of Shur. They went three days in the wilderness and they found no water. And when they came to Marah, they could not drink the water of Marah because it was bitter. That is why it was called Marah. And the people complained against Moses saying, what shall we drink? He cried out to the Lord and the Lord showed him a piece of wood. The original translation says a piece of a tree, shows him a tree. And he threw it into the water and the water became sweet. And there the Lord made for them a statute and an ordinance. And there he put them to the test. He said, if you will listen carefully to the voice of the Lord, your God, and do what is right in his sight and give heed to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will not bring upon you any of the diseases that I brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. Then they came to Elam, where there were 12 springs of water and 70 palm trees, and they camped there by the water. So I'm going to take you on some stops in the life of Moses. And one of these 
crucial kind of places that I want to show you is this place of the bitter waters. And it's a place where God once again meets with Moses. See, Moses knows that God will speak to him. How many of you know that God wants to speak to you, that God will speak to you? You know, we sang a song today, the goodness of God. We sang a song today, firm foundation. We need to know, we need to remember the goodness of God. We need to know and remember that he has spoken in the past and he will speak again. That he has delivered us when we've been faced with challenges. For Moses, it was a big Red Sea in front of him. Even before he knew what was going on, it was a river. And again and again, these challenges had come up, but God had delivered him, delivered him from the river Nile, delivered him from the Red Sea. And now he is at the water of bitterness. Will God deliver him? And not just him, but the people that he's leading. And he looks, he tastes, he sees, he hears these are bitter waters, but will he believe it? Will he accept it that this water is unsuitable for drinking or will he look back at the goodness and faithfulness of God? Will I accept that my plane is not going to take off? Will I accept that the festival needs to be cancelled? Will I accept or will I remember? And will you remember the goodness and the faithfulness of God? And so Moses is faced with this, this challenge. He had many challenges, but in my message today, this is his first challenge. I'm not going to go through every challenge Moses had or we'd be here all day. But in this first challenge, it is a challenge of bitterness, bitter water. And what does God do? As he comes to God, he cries out to God. God provides a piece of tree that he throws into the water and it turns the bitterness into sweetness. It turns what's not drinkable into something that's drinkable, something that is devoid of life into something that has life. I don't know if you've heard uh, any messages on this passage before, but many scholars would agree that this scene is a shadow of the, the Christ. It's a shadow of the cross, that the wood, the tree that is thrown into the water is just like the cross that Jesus hung on and, and the reason that he was shown a piece of a tree is because it was a piece of a tree that took our bitterness, that took our sin, that made life out of something that seemed so impossible and so dead. Bitterness will break you. Bitterness will kill you. Bitterness will destroy your soul. But Jesus came that you might have life and life to the full. He hung on that cross for you to set you free from bitterness and to take you into a sweet, sweet place. And the only way the Israelites could get to the promised land was to learn certain lessons that they would need to sustain them in that place. And the first lesson that they needed to learn and Moses needed to learn is that God can make bitter into sweet. He can bring life out of death. So we have this amazing scene and I hope the Holy Spirit, I pray that the Holy Spirit would be speaking to you right now. In each of these scenes, you would be getting revelation of what the Lord wants to do in your heart and in your life. Bitterness had to go. They had to remember the goodness of God and it was the wood, it is the cross that sets us free today. So they move from this pool and and, and we see that instructions are given for how they're to set up their temple, for what it's going to look like when they get to Israel. And they begin to head towards the promised land, but a little bit of a, a roundabout way, a little bit of a longer way. And they actually get to another pool. I want to take you to this other pool. It's in the book of Numbers chapter 20. It says here, the Israelites, verse 1, the whole congregation came into the wilderness of Zin 
in the first month and the people stayed in Kadesh. Miriam died there and was buried there. Now there was no water for the congregation, so they gathered together against Moses and against Aaron. Remember, Aaron is Moses' kind of right-hand man. And the people quarreled with Moses and they said, Would that we had died when our kindred died before the Lord. Why have you brought the assembly of the Lord into this wilderness for us and our livestock to die here? Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to bring us to this wretched place? It is no place for grain or figs or vines or pomegranates. There's no water to drink. Then Moses and Aaron went away from the assembly to the entrance of the tent of meeting and they fell on their faces and the glory of the Lord appeared to them. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, take the staff, assemble the congregation, you and your brother Aaron, and command the rock before their eyes to yield its water. Thus you shall bring water out of the rock for them. Thus you shall provide drink for the congregation and their livestock. So Moses took the staff from before the Lord as he had commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock. And he said to them, listen, you rebels, shall we bring water for you out of this rock? Then Moses lifted up his hand. He struck the rock twice with his staff. Water came out abundantly and the congregation and their livestock drank. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not trust in me to show my holiness before the eyes of the Israelites, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land that I've given them. These are the waters of Meribah, where the people of Israel quarreled with the Lord and by which he showed his holiness. Meribah, by the way, means to quarrel or to fight. So we have a second stop in the life of Moses, another pool, another place where people would like water, but there is no water. And God speaks to Moses and he says to Moses, Moses, I want you to speak to the rock and water will flow. See, I've already done the work with the tree You see, the cross was enough. You don't need to involve wood anymore. You know your authority. You know who I am. You know my faithfulness. You only need to speak to the rock and water. Life will come out of this hard situation. And what happens? Moses, in his anger, in his frustration, He's so sick of all the complaining. He's so sick of all the quarreling. He's so sick of all the fighting. He says, you want some water? Bam, I give you water. And he strikes the rock twice. And God is so angry and so upset with Moses that he says, Moses, you are not going into the promised land. Do you know the Bible says that the Lord disciplines those he loves? God loved Moses so much that he realized Moses did not have the he did not have the faithfulness and I know some of you are like whoa this is Moses you know this is a great man of God and he is and he was but he did not have the ability to listen and execute under every circumstance that was going to be needed for the battlefields of the promised land. And God said, no, sorry, you're not the one. And of course, we know that Joshua and Caleb, they lead the Israelites into the promised land. And there's so much I could unpack from this. And I just want you to know, I've never preached this message anywhere before. I have wrestled with this all uh, for weeks now on what to bring to this church. But I really felt the Lord wanted to reveal a couple of things to this church. Number one is that we cannot live in bitterness. We cannot live in bitterness. If we live in bitterness, it will destroy us. And number two, we cannot live in quarreling. We cannot live in fighting. Fighting will rob you. It will rob the congregation, but it will also rob your leader. 
So, obviously Pastor Jason's not here today. <laughs> and I've been a pastor before. And I, I don't, you don't need to be a rocket scientist to know that church can be a challenging place. Especially for a leader. But I want to say to you, um, and don't worry, Pastor Jason did not ask me to say this. <laughs> but I want to say this to you um, with fear and trembling that quarrelling will get you nowhere <laughs> and, and it will drive your leader insane. And the thing is, when it comes to this moment in, in the pool, oh, oh, sorry, with this rock, this hard situation, yes, Moses misses out. But how many of you know, because of the complaining and the quarrelling, of the Israelites, the whole generation missed out. And we actually see that in Deuteronomy. It says, uh, sorry, it's Deuteronomy chapter two. Yes, so, uh, Verse 14, the length of time we've travelled from Kadesh, Bernia, until we crossed the Wadi Zered was 38 years until the entire generation of warriors had perished from the camp as the Lord had sworn concerning them. Indeed, the Lord's own hand was against them to root them out from the camp until all had perished. And just as soon as all the warriors had died off from among the people, the Lord spoke to me saying, today you're going to cross the boundary of Moab and Ar. When you approach the frontier of the Ammonites, do not harass them or engage with them in battle. And if we move down, hang on, I'm... It says in verse 23 of chapter 3, At that time too I entreated the Lord, saying, O Lord God, you've only begun to show your servant your greatness and your might. What God in heaven or on earth can perform deeds and mighty acts like yours? Let me cross over to see the good land beyond the Jordan, that good hill country and the Lebanon. But the Lord was angry with me on your account and would not heed me. The Lord said to me, Enough from you. Never speak to me of this matter again. And he basically says, you can go up on the mountain, you can have a look at the promised land, but you're not entering it. And so the, the warriors, the people, the generation, they've got to die off before they can move in. A new generation actually gets to step into the promises of God. And if you want to cross the Jordan River, we're back at water. If you want to cross the Jordan River and move into the promises of God, you have first got to settle your bitterness. You've first got to bring your bitterness to the cross. If you want to move into the promises of God, if you want to move into the, the things of God for you, for your family, for this church, for this congregation, for this community, you've first got to settle your quarrelling. I don't know if there's quarrelling here, by the way. Pastor Jason didn't call me up and say, hey, I've got a few quarrels going on. <laughs> But you know, in your heart, in your spirit, this is the beauty of Holy Spirit. He's the one that convicts, right? That if there's bitterness in your life, if there's quarreling in your life, it needs to be dealt with because God has promises. God has plans. God has great things for this community. He's got great things for your leadership. He's got great things for you. But we need to move through certain tests before we're ready. How many of you know the Bible says not to test the Lord your God? Anyone know that? How many of you know the Bible does not say he does not test you? <laughs> I have literally had the Lord say to me on multiple occasions, Andrew, because you did that, you're not ready for this. He said it to me. I remember one time we were, we were planting a church in America and I did a little video of the mega church behind me. And in my heart, I said, all of my friends in Australia are going to know I've made it because I work at this church of, you know, 20,000 people and rah, rah, rah. Within three weeks, I was back in Australia, unemployed, no visa in America anymore. And I knew the Lord was disciplining me. And it was the best thing he ever did. It was so good. Did I cry? Did I, was it painful? 
Was it one of the hardest seasons of Joyce in my life? Absolutely. But I had to deal with a few things in my life so that I would be ready for what he had for me moving forward. So, I'm wrapping up now, which every preacher says about 20 minutes before they finish. And I want you just just to remember these stops. Number one is bitterness. Allow the cross of Christ. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Allow the cross of Christ to set you free and bring sweetness back into your life. Bitterness puts you in a cage. Do you know, when we... uh, I touched on our time in America and some of you will have heard that story. But when we left America, there was a lady that positioned everything to get me kicked out of America. And when we left America, it cost us about $20,000 personally. And then, um, so we came home to Australia with absolutely nothing. We lost our neighbours. We lost our church plant. We lost our friends. Our daughter was born in America. Our son was going to kindergarten there. Can you imagine being told, which we were told, you have three weeks to leave the country. But prior to that meeting, no one, you had no, no grasp or understanding that that was coming. Imagine if you were told your whole world is invested. We'd been there three years. We were fully invested. You got three weeks to leave the country. And, and I remember walking into my first church service after that meeting, I walked in the back of the church service and I swore. I said uh, a word that I shall not repeat right now. And I turned to my wife and I said, I'm done. And she grabbed me and dragged me back into the church. And she said, no, you're not walking away. Because I was so angry at the church. I was so angry at this lady. I was so bitter. The bitterness was out of control. And we, we found ourselves back in Australia and I remember visiting a, a local church, it was Freedom Church in, in Hillsville and I praise God for all the churches in this region, we need all of them. And I remember they were celebrating their church anniversary and I said to the pastor, I should be celebrating our church plant's anniversary but instead I'm here sitting in the pews of your church and she's like, sounds like you need a bit of... Uh, little bit of forgiveness in your life (laughs) and I remember she said I want you to say right now the lady's name I won't repeat now just because I do put some of my sermons online I remember saying her name and forgiving her and I literally went and something came off me like a spirit of unforgiveness left my body I actually was holding um I was holding Sean at the time he was quite young and I remember Just as she began to pray, I could feel something was about to break off. I was about to be set free. And I handed Sean to Joyce. And I said, hold Sean, I'm getting delivered. And I fell to the ground. I got up. I shook the pastor's hand. I said, you have no idea how much I needed that. Thank you so much. The pastor said that was the easiest deliverance I've ever done. I said, no, no, I've done them on others. I know what was needed. I needed to forgive that lady. Thank you. And... Do you know what I do every time I go to America now, and I go there um, regularly? If I'm ever in California, I make a point to drive down to that church. The church that fired us, that got us removed, that, you know, but actually it was the discipline of the Lord. I can see that now. In the moment, I couldn't see it. And I go into their chapel and I pray for that church. I pray, God, I pray that you'd bless this church. They never know I'm there. I don't tell anyone I'm there. I don't tell any of my old boss or or, or old colleagues or any of the congregants. I just slip in the back and I begin to pray. God, I pray blessing over this church. I pray, God, for revival for this church. I pray, God, that you would bless these pastors and leaders. And I do it year after year after year. Bitterness will destroy you, but with the cross, all things are possible. We've got to move past bitterness and we've got to move past quarrelling. You've heard the saying, cut off your nose to spite your face. 
When we strike the shepherd, the sheep scatter. Can I let you in on a secret? Are you ready for this? Pastor Jason might watch this, so I've got to be careful. Do you know that... Do you know that Pastor Jason isn't a perfect pastor? Yes. I know you do. <laughs> do you know that he makes mistakes? Sometimes he thinks something's a good idea and it really flops. Like, really flops. I've heard a few of his ideas. I'm like, you did that? <laughs> Never gonna work. You know, he's like, yeah, nah, it didn't work. Nah, it, was, it didn't go down too well. It's a good idea at the time. He's not a perfect pastor, but I'm telling you what, the Lord called him here. Yeah. I know it. Yeah. He has a call for the town of Mombok. I know it. And he and Michelle have gone through hell and back to stand in this community and to stand for this community. Yeah. And I could say the same for you, you know, probably for Pam and Karen and, and Andre and other leaders in the place, even for you. I know many of you, you have fought to stay part of this church. And I would just remind you, if I can, in humility and in grace, that quarrelling, it's never good for your leaders, it's never good for you. And I reckon you should all go into the promises of God together. I don't think anyone should be left behind. And I would hate to one day get to a place where I say, oh, he didn't find me faithful. I guess Sean, Abby and Evan will have to carry on the job. I'm like, Lord, I'm stepping into those promises and then they're going to ride on my blessings. You know, like they're going to ride on that and they'll get, take it even further. But I don't want to miss out. Now, I want to remind you, I am closing, remember? remember? Just remember that. I actually want to remind you of the goodness of God as we close. Because you can hear a message like this and you feel condemnation. The devil is the condemner, right? There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But what there is from the Lord is conviction. So condemnation's from the devil, but conviction and discipline, that's from the Lord. I want to speak to people that you feel like you've blown it. You feel like you're on the bench. You feel like God... The promises of God passed you by somehow. You, you missed it. You missed the opportunity. God spoke to you. You never did it. You know, you know in your heart that you missed out on this or you missed out on that. Mark chapter 9. Truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see that the kingdom of God has come with power. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter, James and John, and he led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses who were talking with Jesus. Do you know where that mountain was? In the promised land. I don't know how this works. Maybe everyone's worshipping God in heaven. The, the angels are worshipping and then God says... Oh, I need people to see who my son is. I, some of his disciples really need to see that he really is a part of this trinity. Elijah, Moses, can you two please go down? You're going to stand on a mountain and talk with my son. The disciples are going to see it. You actually need to have a conversation with him. He's about to go into the most challenging time of his life. Would you go and talk to my son for a little while? I don't know how it worked. I don't know how the conversation went. But I thought Moses wasn't allowed to go into the promised land. I'm not making a theological statement, but I am just reflecting on the goodness of God. Oh God, 
but you called me to, but I never got to. He goes, but just you wait, just you wait. You might not enter in in this life, but in eternity, I'm going to put you on that mountain. And not just on that mountain, you're going to get to hang out with Elijah and my son. I remember going back to, to America and um, being invited to preach at a church plant that was right in the same industrial complex that we had looked at planting our church. We'd planted the church, we, we were in a home, then we were in a community centre, and then we left. And I always wanted to get a building in this industrial space. And do you know when, one of the reasons that we got asked to leave that church is because gold dust would appear everywhere when I would preach. It was bizarre. And uh, I would sit down, the two chairs next to me would be covered in gold dust. And the pastors would say, what is that? And the other pastor would say, I don't know, some Holy Spirit thing. It was quite a conservative church. And the reason they asked me to leave is because people were getting gold fillings, falling down in the spirit. Gold dust was appearing on the roof. And they just figured I was probably a little too much for the church. So I packed up my bags and moved back to Australia with my family. But I was in... I have since been invited back to my friend's church plant that he planted around the same time as, as, um, as us. And do you know what happened the other day? It's a crazy story. I was there, it was November of last year, so end of the year last year. I preached in his church and you know, I stood to the side of his church and I prayed and I thanked the Lord that he would still be using me in California, this place that I thought I would never get to see the promised land. I thought I'd never get to see the promises of God. I'd blown it. And I stood there and I prayed and I just said, God, thank you that you would still use me in California. I pray that you'd speak through me today. I'm just off by myself praying before I get up to preach. And the entire area I was standing in was covered in gold dust. And I thought... I can't explain it, but I knew God was there. And maybe there's moments that have robbed you and there's a temptation to fall into bitterness. Maybe there's people that have frustrated you and you want to quarrel and you want to complain. But I'm here today to tell you God is faithful and he wants to lead you into his promises. And even if you've blown it, God is still faithful and he still wants to lead you into his promises. He still wants to lead you into a sweet place, into a place of peace and into his promises over your life. So we're going to pray. Is that okay? Yeah. I normally, you know, I'm normally the evangelist, but today I think maybe, I don't know what you'd call me. The pastor, prophet or something, I don't know. But when the Lord tells you to speak something, you need to do it. I prefer to tell you stories around evangelism, but how are we going to reach the world and bring them into family and community if we're bringing them into bitterness and quarrelling? And I'm not saying that's the case here, but I know it can be the case for me sometimes. So right now, we just ask Holy Spirit that you'd speak to us. We ask, Lord God, that you would illuminate to us anything that we need to release to you. Anyone that we need to forgive. And we reflect right now on the goodness of God. We reflect right now on the cross. And we thank you, God, that while we were still sinners, while we were still in bitterness, while we were still in quarreling, while we were still in pornography, while we were still in anger, while we were still in frustration, while we were still in holding grudges, while we were still sinners, you died for us. And right now, if you're here and you would say, Andrew, I'm not walking with God. I'm not 
yet a Christian. I do not believe or have not believed up until this point that Jesus is the son of God, that he died on the cross for my sin and rose again. But I do believe that now. I've heard it, but now I believe it. And if you're here and you'd say, I want to repent, I want to follow Jesus, I want to become a Christian. Maybe you're so far from God, but today's the day you want to come back to God. I want to pray for you before I move on. If that's you and you say, Andrew, I want to follow Jesus, can you just lift your hand right now? Maybe you're away from God and you want to come back to God. Maybe today you just say, I want to become a follower of Jesus. If that's you, just lift your hand right now because I want to pray for some other people as well. Is there anyone? Yes, I see that hand. God sees your hand. He sees your heart. Is there anyone else that would say, I need to get right with God. And just before we, we move on, I want to get right with God. I don't want to wait till tomorrow. If that's you, just lift your hand right now because I want to pray for you. All right. Let's pray together. I want to, I, want to, I know I started praying, now I'm praying again, but just, just walk with me on this. Let's pray a prayer for anyone that needs to get right with God right now. I'm going to pray and then you repeat. Are you ready? Dear Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. I choose to follow you. Save me now. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. I will live for you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name. Amen. And now for anyone here that you, you just know that God has put his finger on certain things today, I believe that he wants to minister to your heart. So um, I'm wondering if, I don't know if this is possible, David, but if, if you're able to find, or Nigel, that song, Show Me Your Face, Lord, and, uh, and play it uh, through the speakers that's possible because that just that'll free Joyce and I up to pray for people and if you need prayer today if you if you need to do business with God we just want to open open up this space I'm aware that it's midday but let's be honest it's 40 degrees outside so you're better off staying in here anyway um, if you if you're if you're here and you just want someone to pray with you just like I went forward at Freedom Center I needed, I needed to forgive someone, I needed to let it go, and, it, and it, was so, it was such a gift. If there's someone you need to forgive, if there's something you need to let go, if there's something you even need to repent of today, then the Lord just wants to give you space and an opportunity to do that. Um, I've done this before here, I believe, but if you would like just to respond before the Lord, just come over to this side of the church and no one's going to pray for you. No one's going to lay hands on you because sometimes you just need to deal with Jesus. It's like, God, we need to speak. And the act of moving out of your seat, it's like an act of faith, an act of obedience. And you're saying, God, I'm serious. Like, I'm serious. Meet with me. So this space here is for people that don't want prayer. But if you'd like prayer, could you come up to your left, my right, in this space here, we'd love to pray for you, even over here. So basically, this speaker on, that's leave me alone, I'm hanging out with the Lord. And then over here is, is um, please pray with me because I need prayer. Is that good? All right, thank you, Jesus, for what you've done today. We just give you this time and we believe, God, that you're going to meet with us. God, I pray for Mombok Christian Fellowship. I pray, Lord God, that this church would be so known by their love one for another that people would say they are disciples of Jesus. I've heard of this whole Christian thing, but these guys are the real deal. I've heard, you know, that church is full of hypocrisy and abuse, and, but this church, they, there's something different. And I pray in Jesus' mighty name that the promises of God would come to pass in this community, that we would see the prodigals come home, that we would see revival on the streets, we would see people get saved in the petrol stations, in the Woolworths, down uh, in the cafes, God. I pray, Lord God, that we would see neighbours come to you. I pray, God, that you would pour out your spirit in this church and that we would not grow weary of doing good. I'm actually going to invite the leaders. If you're one of the leaders in the church, would you come forward? I want to pray for you. 
um, if you're an, an elder or a pastor, a small group leader, a worship leader, um, I'd love to just, just pray for any of, any of the leadership team. Um, and we can put that, do, do we, were we able to do it? So good, thanks so much. So just come over here, guys, if that's all right. Um, anyone else is welcome um, you know, to join. If you'd like prayer, come over to this side. If you just want to spend time with the Lord, just jump over there. I'll get Joyce to jump in as well. I'll try and, we'd love to pray for the leaders first because then the leaders can turn around and pray for others if you feel you're in that space. Um, but let's just have a prayer meeting. Let's spend some time with the Lord. And uh, that'd be great. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah. Do not grow weary in doing